Good afternoon, everyone. We're so excited to be back with Life on Purpose Live. We have a very special guest today with an a, incredible background from so many perspectives. We have Brad Pilo, president and executive producer of The Chosen. Welcome, Brad. We're so excited to have you. Beth, it's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, I'm going to correct you right off. You pronounce my name Pello like hello. Hello, Pello. Hello, Pello. Well, thank you for that. That's yeah. awesome. And uh, I understand you just traded in your, uh, your winter gloves for cowboy boots, right? Indeed. Yes. In fact, I'm looking, looking for the right brand. I'm getting recommendations from folks, but never had cowboy boots. Well, since I was three years old, I had them when I was three. Well, I've enjoyed, we were talking before, getting to know Brad's wife, Melody. Um, we're in a prayer group, an online group to pray for the chosen. So I knew that little tidbit about y'all moving closer to Texas from his wife. And you also have 12 children, not, not three, not four, not 10, but 12. <laughs> we, we have 12 children. I can see them over my, my uh, oh, shoulder here. That. So that, you... that's our Christmas card, 19 grandchildren and 12 children. Yes, a very proud papa. I'm so excited. That is amazing. So before we get to The Chosen, I, I want to talk to you about, I mean, what a background you have. I mean, technology, I mean, technology when technology was just becoming like the thing. Uh, gaming, um, television, production, um, Ancestry.com. And at eight years old, you said you wanted to start your own business and change the world. How did you know at eight years old you were going to actually do that? Well, I aspired to do it. Uh, my, I had a beautiful mother who read bedtime stories to me as a child. And one of my favorite books as a young boy was a book called Little People Who Became Great. And wow. each chapter in that book was the story of a by then famous person, so Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, Thomas Edison, and it told the story of their childhood. And then it described how they dreamed of a better future and what it is that they created in their adult life uh, to make an impact, have an impact on the world. So that's how I became inspired. My mother reading stories of other living and and deceased human beings who I could try to be like. Well, that's so interesting because I truly believe the way to change the world is one story at a time, which is so much why I do what I do, because I think if we get those great stories out there and inspire others, it can, it, it, it changed your, your whole world and your whole life. So, and you, you were so successful early in that you had an article written to you about you. And I believe your brother-in-law as the teen tycoon tycoon in the new york times and so how did you become so successful so quickly because it's not just about stories it's about skill and planning and strategy <laughs> well uh, first of all i was 16 when that article in the new york times was written and it was not because i was successful it's because i was unusual so back, this would have been in, I believe, 79 when that article was written. Um, we didn't think of entrepreneurial endeavors being young people's things mm -hmm. to do. You know, it was something that uh, the traveling salesman who decides to leave the big company and start his own sales company. So, yeah, that's what was unusual about me is that as a teenager, I had already started my own business in those days, it wasn't even legal to start your own business as a teenager. I had to find an adult to sign the legal documents for me. So that's what made my story unusual. I just happened to be a young, young kid who decided I wanted to grow up faster, probably than I should have. So, <laughs> uh, and in terms of success, Beth, you know, I've come to see success very differently at this stage of life than I did as a young man. I was very ambitious in my early career um, and, and kind of was following the formulas of the world. I was raised a Christian, that same mother who wrote, read stories to me about famous people also read stories to me about Jesus. So mm -hmm. I professed the principles of Christianity. I think I was fairly honest and 
hardworking and charitable, but um, I was still doing it in the world's way. And so, yes, you can look at what I call Brad 1.0, that early chapter of my life as being successful because I built companies and I became a millionaire and I did things that the world would see as, as meaningful. And then one day I woke up with terminal can cancer. This was oh. 20 years ago. Wow. And um, I, I realized they had no treatment for me. They sent me home to die. And I realized, is this really the measure of my life? Is this what I want? Do I want to be known as the founder of companies that make people money? Uh, in the meantime, it had taken me away from my growing family. I wasn't a present father uh, or husband, um, was not living out my faith abundantly. So, so yeah, I don't like to think of my life as having been successful, at least at that stage. And, and then I entered the second stage of, of Brad. I call it Brad 2.0. And, uh, and uh, I didn't die is the good news. Uh, praise God. Mm -hmm. And Brad 2.0 became a very a much more present father and a husband and neighbor and friend and brother and son. Um, and, and that kind of brings me to Brad 3.0, which is what I'm living now, which is a surrendered Brad. Um, so I, I, I left ambition to be present and now I leave not only being present, which I work on, but also being surrendered and just leaving it to God, uh, to do with me as he wishes. And the measure of my life is the degree to which I've given myself to him. That's so incredible. So, so if it, I know you've, you've done a lot in leadership as well. So when you're leading other business leaders, creatives, um, left brain, right brain, because you've got that technical brain as well. What is your, what is your best advice to someone who is ambitious, much like you were, um, and they do want to change the world through business and things like that. How do you blend your, your 102 and your 202 and your 302 or, or those three seasons of your life into um, lessons learned that can help other people not trip up on the not being present and, you know, missing those years of engagement and where it really mattered? Well, that's a great question. So here's, here's the model that I've used. Brad 1.0 looked at people as means to an end. Mm. Um, you could think of them like chess pieces on a board. And so they, they might be useful. They might be in the right position. They might not be. But that's sort of up to me to figure out how to play things out. Mm -hmm. Brad 2.0 was present, meaning I chose to see people because the alternative for me was to be dead. And so I said, well, if, if God's going to allow me to live, then, then I want to see my fellow men. And, and so my work in Brad 2.0 became much more around what are your giftings? How can I enable you? And, and so that would look like mentorship, maybe mentor mm -hmm. leadership. I was still leading organizations but I was really looking for the giftings that others were bringing, not to me and to my own ends, but to the team as a collaborative effort. So that's where the right brain and the left brain people need to come together to appreciate each other's strengths. And I, as a leader, become a facilitator of synthesizing all of that together. And then I would say Brad 3.0 is not only looking at the giftings, but he's asking God. He's saying, of these giftings, of these people, how can I bless them? How can I bless them through my leadership? Not just to help them bring their giftings to the table, but beyond what's evident in the workplace, what is it in their personal life that's important? Where might they be struggling in, in family or health or other issues? And so then I kind of had to limit, I had to release the boundaries that I had put um, so I went from objectifying people to seeing them and now to inviting God to see them through me, uh, using me, I should say. That's incredible because, you know, we're, we're living in a world that's disconnected. We, we've got a lot of young people who feel isolated. They feel invisible. 
And yet technology, and, and you've been on the ground floor of some really incredible things that uh, N Nintendo, Ancestry.com, this technology thing has been great. But at the other end, we've got to have a discipline where technology is concerned, because if we don't, if we don't unplug from the, you know, the devices and everything, then we do disconnect from the people. So, so, so at, at 3.0, now you've learned to utilize the best of that world, but at the same time, not become consumed by it. Is that like a, a skill that we all have to learn? It's a skill we all have to learn. And it's, I think of it this way, our children that are digitally native, meaning they've never known anything but the native world, the native mm -hmm. digital world. Um, they, they kind of look at those digital devices as, as, like air we breathe, right? It's ever present. And so we look at them kind of critically, why can't you put that down, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the truth is, is outside of what I call the algorithm driven social media world, where I think it becomes very unhealthy, I think most of them are better equipped than we are as adults uh, to, to kind of engage digitally. So for me personally, it's become a quest to recognize it's just a tool. It's not necessarily a means uh, in and of itself. And, and I have other great examples. So I'll, I'll use Dallas Jenkins, who's the director and, and uh, creator of The Chosen. He is very digitally adept, um, almost to an extreme in terms of, he, he says to us, my love language is texting. But when you are with him, he's totally present like his phone is mm. not out if, if he ever takes it out he said he'll just tell you i'm taking notes and he is he's he's right there with you and so i mm -hmm. think the discipline that we need as a society particularly those of us that are not digitally native um we we kind of get sucked into the why isn't this working and and it didn't beep at me when it should have and i missed that message and we kind of become obsessive about it we need to learn to just set it down Put it to bed with the children, not take it to bed with us. Yeah, there's no one more important than the one sitting across from you right now. You know, the old love the one you're with song is uh, something t somebody taught me years ago. And that's so true when it comes to technology. So um, in, in, in talking about technology as a filmmaker, as a, a very successful filmmaker, uh, we have an opportunity to use this, the, the World Wide Web, the technology, the streaming and everything to reach the world with great media as, as what you're doing. Uh, and there's a lot of filmmakers out there. I know you've been in, involved with publishing and things like that. All the people that, are, are, that have a purpose and they feel like God's called them to make a movie or write a book or step into that next level of faith and dreaming and entrepreneurship. Um, what do you say to someone now that you have conquered some of those hills about taking that and keeping it excellent? Because if we're gonna do it, we gotta do it really, really well and not cut corners, right? Yes, uh, now here's, here's the challenge we have that God's given all of us breath, right? Our hearts beat because he allows it. And in whatever giftings we have, whatever passions of our heart, our purpose, our life's purpose, if we want to think about it that way, is, um, is the blessing of being able to use that. But it's in the using it that, that the gift becomes enlarged. And, and I'm not going to judge another's gift based on its presence next to someone else's presence. Meaning uh, in the filmmaking realm, uh, the industry is built around criticism. It's a profession, right? We call them film sure. critics. Mm -hmm. and, and we ourselves, when we talk about a show, we compare it to another show. Um, when we read a book, it, similarly, it, it's like this book, but not as good or whatever. So we've been raised to think that our gifts need to be judged by others. And unfortunately, that's the failing because some of us become frozen in just the prospect of judgment by others, meaning we hide the gift under the bushel, to use the proverbial scripture. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Others of us live small, 
So we say, this is my little gift. I hope you like it. We're kind of bashful with it, right? Um, other of, others might be on the other extreme. It's like, look at me, I'm wonderful, I'm great. And, and uh, a little narcissistically, we say, my gift's important. But I believe when we humbly give our gift and just let it be and let us remain open to learning in that process of, you know, how can that gift bless? Um, one way to think of it professionally is what is the audience? So when I was a publisher, people would bring manuscripts to me and they would say, I know for a fact that this needs to be published by you because if it's published by you, it'll reach this large audience. And I would read the manuscript and I would say, this is a beautiful manuscript, but I think you've got your audience wrong. This is like the perfect manus legacy manuscript for your family or for your church community, for people who know you, people who want to feel connected to you, who want to learn from your life experience. And don't take that as a rejection. Take that as that's the gift's purpose. The fact that I choose not to publish it and make it available to millions of people is not a judgment on you. It's just, you know, live where you're planted. And as that little plant grows and blossoms, you'll become better qualified or you'll attract an audience that can see what you're doing here and you kind of grow out of that spot rather than imagining I'm only successful if I get the, you know, gold medal. So that's my advice to people um, is A, to honor the gifting you've, you've received, B, to not be your own worst critic of it, nor to listen to the criticisms of, of others. Do listen in a spirit of learning, but recognize the difference between criticism and, and mentorship or correction, particularly godly correction. We want that. And, yeah. and then live, live as large as you can within the garden you're planted. That's so well said. And, um, you know, it's, it's so true. And, and, you know, people, I mean, my, my book is Life on Purpose. We did a TV show called Life on Purpose. What do you say to someone who's struggling with the idea of their purpose? What do I do with my life? Hmm. Yeah, we would. We all want that little ticker tape to come out of our pocket. Yeah, we do. We <laughs> want the memo. We want the memo A, B, C, and D. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So here's my. Here's what I believe. I believe we we know, and it's it's really really hard for us to face what we know. And if you want to know what you know, go back, go back a few layers deeper, like. Go, go back to uh, using my same metaphor about um, Brad 1.0 and Brad 2.0. So, you know, here's, here's Brad zero, if you want to think of it that way. You know, 10-year-old <laughs> little, Brad, Brad. little Brad, little Brad. What, what did little Brad think his life would be like? Not in terms of accomplishments, but what was his passion? What did he really believe? Um, and, and little Brad was very creative, not nearly as analytical as I became. Um, I went into business and, and building businesses essentially to escape uh, my artistic side, right? Um, I won art contests when I was young. I sang solos in school programs when I was young. Um, and, and there came this moment, I haven't identified it, identified it discreetly, but this moment where I said, I'm maybe I got picked on by other boys who said that's not a boy thing to do. I don't know. But at some point I decided, okay, that's not me. This, this other thing is me. And I went and pursued that other thing. Um, I would, I would bet you that if most of us just stopped and, and we said, what is the truth about my heart? What does my heart really long for? Um, what sort of uh, shields protections have I put over that heart so that it doesn't get hurt? And if I kind of remove those shields, what would it reveal about me? And I bet if we go to that place, we'll find deeper purpose. Um, and wow. again, I'm not saying we all, I, I remember playing pretend when I was a kid and lots of things that were just fantastic. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, 
you know, this adolescent stage where we still believed in ourselves and still had a lot of hope. I think there's a lot of truth to be found right there. That is so true. And, and when you think about it, um, and especially in watching The Chosen, um, which we'll get to next, is, you know, we have to, even Jesus pulled away to seek that deeper heart that was uh, pure and, you know, un, undistracted from the world. And that's so countercultural because we're so distracted that the very answers that we seek for our life may be hidden in that quiet place, mm. basically. Mm -hmm. They're always hidden there. That's the pearl. Always. That's the pearl. That is such a good thing. That's such a good word. So let's let's go into the chosen because I know we don't have a lot of time. So what's it like to work in the midst of all that crazy, fun, chosen stuff? It's crazy. It's fun. It actually is a beautiful thing to witness. Um, I consider myself sometimes an observer because there's there are big pieces of the business I I have little to contribute. I don't write story. I don't direct. I don't do what Dallas Jenkins does. He's, he's brilliant, genius. Um, my job here is to enable that to happen effectively, successfully, uh, without obstacle, and then to take that creation and bring it to the world. And, and that's why this is such a beautiful thing to witness is because um, if you've ever heard Dallas's story, you know, he came to this place of surrender in his own life. And, yes. and once he kind of gave what he calls his loaves and fishes and stopped worrying about who it impacted, who it reached, then in that freedom, it reached an audience far beyond what any of us imagined. And so I see that every day in a thousand ways. You know, I see it in the impact it's having on set today, I spent the morning on set and, uh, in, you know, in welcoming the actors back. This is the second week we've, we've been in production and some actors weren't here last week. I wanted to greet them this week. Um, and, I, and I see how excited they are to tell these stories and the impact it's had on them. But I also see it every day in what Hollywood would call fans. I would just call them, you know, my brothers and sisters. We're all experiencing the same thing. When, when I watch the finished show, actually, when I read the script, you know, I'm being impacted because it's revealing to me a Jesus that is relational. And I kind mm -hmm. of grew up as a Christian young boy who felt like this Jesus was a transactional Jesus. He was a judgmental Jesus. He, he wouldn't play with me. He wouldn't laugh with me. He wouldn't dance with me. He wouldn't sit down, you know, and really have a conversation about my heart, my true needs. And I've been introduced to that Jesus in this story. And, and now as I go back to scripture, I realize he was there all along. I had just mm. put a mask on him uh, in kind of the way I chose to interpret or the way it had been modeled for me. Um, and so now that I see the impact that it's having on many, and, and particularly because my team, there are 60 of us full time working year round at The Chosen, and, and everything we're doing is here being done to reach millions, a billion, the first billion, we call it now, you know, the world. And so we have amazing partners. The Come and See Foundation has come alongside us uh, to help us raise the money for the show, to help the outreach through nonprofits and churches. Um, besides uh, the Chosen app, you can now watch The Chosen on Netflix and Peacock and Amazon. And, and so I love developing those relationships. And I see miracles happening every day in kind of every facet of bringing The Chosen to the world. And the, the, the interesting thing, you talk about the app, you know, my husband and I laugh because we're sitting here watching The Chosen and I'm like, I'm casting, I'm casting because, you know, I've never been able to cast before, like throw something from my phone into my TV. So I'm like, man, I'm technical, you know, I'm, you know, <laughs> proud of myself. But you've got the wonderful film, the filming, the show, but then you've got all the technical uh, benefits of people being able to be involved and, you know, 
the comments just as the live streams are going on. I mean, thousands and thousands of comments. So you've done something as a big team, and I know it's a, a team effort, so different that people do feel they're part of something. And it is a, a, a movement. It is a lot of momentum. And I think that I think that the bringing both those worlds together in such a beautiful way makes the technology part of it so good because people people are right there with the whole team. Yeah, and that, this wouldn't have been able to happen even 10 years ago. And, and so when I did my first film, which was 20 years ago, um, you know, I had to simply make a film and go deliver it to the studio and then they put it in theaters and then they put it on DVDs or VHS tapes, even in those days. And, and I didn't ever meet my audience. You know, I could go watch it in a theater with someone and, and watch them laugh together, which brought a lot of satisfaction, but I didn't really feel like we were participating together. Yeah. Now today, every day, thousands of people today participate in the creation of The Chosen. They participate by donating to the Come and See Foundation. Pay it forward, yeah, and and, paying it forward. You know, I, I see their names, I see their generosity, I see their notes of thanks. Um, we, we have so many people who evangelize the show, not in the way that you would evangelize a Netflix series, but in the way you would say, this had an impact on me, it's changed me. And when we're changed, we want other people to, to experience that change in their own lives. And my wife and I were just on a walk over lunch in the neighborhood here and met a woman and, you know, I'm, I'm wearing my chosen sweater. And the question is, what's the chosen? And, oh, you don't know about the chosen. Let me tell you about the chosen. And it's just, it brings me joy, not, not in a bragging way to talk about what I'm creating, but knowing that if they'll watch it, they'll love it. And it'll, it'll have impact on them. It'll change their perception of what a relationship with God can be like. That's so incredible. And we've, we're going to have to wrap it up here because I know we have a hard close in, in, in a couple minutes. But So let's talk about what we can get excited about. We're excited about what we've seen. We're excited about season four. How far are we going to go? And what's this going to look like as this plays out to the whole end of The Chosen? I mean, this is just incredible to get to anticipate yeah so season three has been released you can watch it on the chosen app uh season four is now in production as i mentioned week two right now we'll film season four through the summer so late july early august we'll wrap up the filming portion then it goes into post-production and we will uh we'll release season four as soon as it's done but uh that'll be within the next year right and then there's season five, season six, and even season seven. So there are seven seasons planned, and it'll take us all the way through um, the crucifixion, the resurrection, and, of course, the ascension. So the, the story will play out as we have it in the New Testament. And um, what, what lies beyond that is yet to be seen, but at least we've got a good four years ahead of us to complete the series. You've got plenty of work to keep you busy for the next little while, right? Indeed, indeed. Yeah. Well, Brad, I'm so excited to get to talk to you. Like I said, I've enjoyed getting to know Melody, and I've enjoyed that part of the, the streaming and seeing uh, the prayer teams and everybody behind what you're doing. But, I mean, this is really, really changing the world, and it's changing it one story at a time. And I'm so grateful to get to talk to you and to get to watch. and I get to come and see and, um, you know, just see it all happen because it's, uh, it's an incredible time. At what timing we need the chosen right now. And guess what? We have it. So hats off yeah. to the whole team. Well, thank you, Beth, for your support and for visiting with me today. And, and to your audience, the many who support us from around the world. It's such a beautiful blessing. Well, thank you. Thank you for taking time. I know you're busy. Give your wife Melody a hug and um, tell her I said hello, too. I will. Thank you, Beth. All right. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh,